Hello everybody, good evening. Uh, welcome to Art Park Ideas Series. It's so great to see your names in the list of our attendees and so great to have our guests with us tonight, a very special guest for Art Park tonight. Um, today we're going to continue and in, this is the last conversation in the series so far, but we'll have more uh, soon. Uh, we discussed the what is the art park idea. Uh, the conversations are hosted by Dr. Anthony Bennon, and today with us we have uh, Philip Burke, one of our favorite residence artists. <laughs> okay, everybody's a favorite, but Philip is definitely uh, one of our absolute favorites. It's a different type of residency. It's uh, it's an art park today kind of residency that reflects very much what art park is today with our rock uh, culture uh, and our thousands and hundreds of thousands of fans and our great music stars and Philip fits in with that picture most perfectly. With that I'll hand it over to Dr. Anthony Bennon. Please remember that this is uh, a fundraiser as part of our art park live campaign uh, and Philip's manager, John Bartolome, has uh, very generously donated Philip's posters for sale as part of uh, this fundraiser. So with your donation of a minimum of $150, you can walk away with one of the posters. We have many for you to choose from. Uh, please contact us So go, go to artpark.net donate if you want a specific one, just let us know. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Anthony Bennon and welcome, Philip. Thank you. It's great to be here. And thank you, Sonia Clark, president of Art Park. It is um, in the interest of full disclosure that I acknowledge that uh, Philip Burke is one of my favorite artists in the uh, in the course of my career in the arts and I am so pleased to have a chance to to speak with him uh, and because of our uh, friendship I will um, will not um, continue my politeness in asking questions but I shall take with with forethought uh, certain liberties such as in my first question um, why in the world would you become an artist? Was there a time that you wanted to be a fireman or some other worthy trade? Well, not a fireman, but when I was very young, I don't know, maybe preteen or when I was a young boy, I was convinced I was going to be a paleontologist. Ooh. And um, when I think about it, I have a feeling it may have had something to do subconsciously with these animals that were very extreme forms. But at any rate, uh, yeah, that was when I was very young. But when I saw it, when I, when I came upon the world of caricature, that evaporated. Well, there was an artist in uh, Germany, a part of the... Uh, of the uh... Uh, Dusseldorf group and uh, he his name is Pitt Moog and he went back to making paintings in accordance with his desire to be a paleontologist wow. might might we trace in your work any paleontological um, references no no I walk, completely <laughs> walked away from that <laughs> uh, now but there are many animal references uh-huh but no uh, dinosaur reference. Well, that's not true. I think I had I did do Frank Sinatra as a T Rex one time. Mm -hmm. uh, what in what about your paint handling? Might that uh, might that uh, have reference to uh, fossil forms or um, elements of the earth? The surprise that we find in the textures of the earth. Can't say that unless it's subconscious. Can't mm. say. No, well, I, I only even think about it because you asked me, because it's not something I would actually think about. <laughs> well, God bless on that one. The uh, what? So what brought you out as an artist? 
Well, to begin with, when I was very young, my mom would take me and my siblings, I think one of them's on today, Joe. Hi, Joe. <laughs> um, but anyway, would take us Saturday mornings to the basement of Rockwell Hall at Buff State, where we would have drawing classes by some of the students there. So that was put into our minds early on. But what really brought me out, so to speak, was the work of David Levine. And David Levine is like the father of modern day caricature, who was famous in the 60s, 70s for his cross etching caricatures for Esquire and most famously New York Review of Books. But he really started a new brush of caricature, including my own work. Once I saw his work, I just couldn't stop trying to do it. Well, that's an interesting trace. Um, let's go back in time uh, to artists who utilize the strategies of caricature. Um, Peter Bru Bruegel, the Elder, um, Goya, um, Hogarth, uh, the Rake's Progress, I'm thinking of with Hogarth, um, Daumier. Delacroix. When, when I go ahead. When I first, when I became seriously interested in caricature, I was going to a, kind of a special high school in Locale Sanction. It had a program where you would just focus on your own thing, kind of as a college thesis kind of thing. And so I seriously went into the work of Hogarth and Goya mm -hmm. and Daumier and Thomas oh. Nast and studied them intently. Mm -hmm. um, but again, and I, and I think that inform, informed a lot of my early work, but I have to say that it was David Levine's work that I was, that gave me the passion to do it. And mm -hmm. then not long after that, I started to become aware of Ralph Steadman's work. He was doing the political drawings for Rolling Stone during the seventies. And I'd pick up every Rolling Stone I could to see his wild caricatures. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really those two artists that, that fueled my fire. Your work is certainly marked by an excess of color. Um, what is it about you and color? Well, it's interesting because um, the very first painting I ever did in my life, I remember being, I was in New York. I had been spent a couple of years already doing pen and ink drawings for magazines but I was getting more and more of a feeling of wanting to paint. And I was at a friend's place who had, I don't know if this is coincidence or not, but I was at a friend's place who had, a, you know, painting supplies. And I opened up a book of the Fauves, Matisse and the Fauves. And that was just like something clicked. Mm. And right from the start, my work was full of wild, wild colors. Um, but then I stepped back a little and started, when I decided I really wanted to paint, I stepped back a little and was studying Manet. But I have to say that it was Van Gogh, Matisse, Picasso, those artists who still are my most inspirational artists um, that drew me into this world of, you know, unabandoned, you know, excitement of color. Let's put Art Park into the picture. You. Um... How long have you lived in Niagara Falls? I've lived in Niagara Falls on and off since, um, let's see, about 93, mm -hmm. but completely living here for the past 10 years, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. and, and prior to your residency in these last several years, have you, um, did you haunt Art Park? Oh, yes. Uh, from the time I was permanently in Niagara Falls, Art Park was definitely my refuge. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's just so beautiful there. And you, it takes a few steps to feel like you're away from any civilization, you know, except if it's a real, you know, holiday or something. But I spent a lot of time walking the trails of Art Park. That was my favorite. Uh -huh. Now, in the, in the course of your visits, did you connect with any of the resident artists? No. No, what, what happened is... Uh, as soon as Sonia showed up at Art Park, she mm -hmm. happened to come to Music is Art in Buffalo, the festival that Robbie Takak does, yes. and saw me painting live there. Uh -huh. 
And then we um, hooked up immediately after that, and she came up with this idea for me to do paintings at concerts, mm -hmm. which for me was always a dream, you know. Mm. And, and so that, that's been great. Now you know, I'm pretty sure that was your idea, but I think we were walking together at Art Park. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember this being your idea, but okay. Really? Oh, cool. I think I so. thought it was your idea, but I do remember our walk at Art Park. I remember you showed yeah. me where the artists and residents used to live. And... Yeah, I think we came up with it together. It was a very natural thing to yeah. do. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Now in the actually so, the first thing you did was hire me to paint the outgoing CEO. George Osborne, yes. Yes. Yep. Commissioned our board commissioned Philip to do a portrait of George Osborne as his um as as his gift to us because we kept the portrait and we're very proud of it. It's at Art Park. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I must see it. The um but in the course of the um, residency, you met uh, an awful lot of interesting people, and there's an intimacy, isn't there, with uh, uh, between you and the and the subject? There, there must be um, something that you would encourage, as I as I understand your work at the park. Um, the, for you had an opportunity to uh, to meet the artists. Um, yes, that, we did encourage that. And it happened quite a few times. Um, mm -hmm. but I feel like I have an intimate relationship with every person on paint, and mm -hmm. you know, that's been over a thousand. But to mm -hmm. actually have an intimate relationship with the actual person, so it's yes. not just in my mind, is, is a much more you know rare thing. But it did happen several times, at least half the time. And it it was just wonderful what would happen in the painting, particularly if I was able to see them before the concert started. Mm -hmm. And one particularly great uh, experience that Sonia and I had was with Shirley Manson of Garbage. Now, I had a little bit of history with her where I had done a project for Rolling Stone where I found out that she liked the painting I did for the contents page and I gifted it to her. And so there was a nice warm feeling there. But she invited us into her dressing room and for a full half hour, right up until she went on stage, it was like, you know, we were best friends. She was just asking all, us all kinds of questions about what we were about and, you know, what were we doing? And it was just wonderful. And there, but there were a few experiences like that where it took all the pressure off of the painting. You know, there's a, I, I have a background of being on deadline for 40 years for editorial. So I have, I can deal with a lot of pressure. The pressure of getting the painting done from the time the concert starts till it ends, or for the most part done, uh -huh. was a different kind of pressure. And um, it, I think all those years of editorial deadlines prepared me for it. But when I was able to meet the artist, it, it would help me get out of my head and help me just go straight from the heart. You have, um, uh, or, or the park has, has uh, prepared, uh, some photographs of you uh, while you were in residence. Might we see them now? Oh, great. There she is, Shirley. There's Shirley. Yeah. Well, talk us through this. Where are you? What's well, the setup? I'm, this is my setup. And, you know, it's like a covering in case of the weather, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But... The reason I wanted people to see this picture was just to get an idea of how much I'm in love with color and every individual color and how I have really have a relationship with colors. But this was the painting that resulted, that was resulting from our time we spent with Shirley. But, um, well, you can see in the distance how I'm combining many different images it's not as good as painting from life, but it, it takes me a little closer to it because there may be 30 moments I'm painting from. When I'm painting from life, it's infinite number of moments, but it's a little bit better than just, okay, the, take this photo and try to paint it. But, um, but the, the, the color, you can kind of see it's loosely a color wheel, but it's my favorite colors, the colors that speak to me and the pigments that you're able to buy. 
Mm-hmm. And each color really does have kind of like a psychological, this sounds really corny and dumb, but I do feel like I have a relationship with each color, a personal relationship. Go on. They're my good friends. And they tell me, and they help me describe different aspects of a person. But it's kind of, it's not forced and it's not intellectual. It's really more intuitive. But there are some basic, basic um, things like maybe what what a blue or a green is going to bring out in terms of a more of a coldness of a person mm. or a pink or orange is the, the opposite. But it's really the interplay. It's really the interplay of the colors. I had an interesting experience I wanted to share when I was, I always really enjoyed doing the brilliant colors in my paintings when I was doing paintings for magazines. But something happened when I was doing the table of contents page in the early 90s for Rolling Stone, where I would send them uh, transparency of my painting. And then they, because they wanted to put it on the contents page and the white background had to be pure white so that it kind of blended into the contents page, I noticed they were like, in a sense, blowing out the image. And I would see the magazine and the the colors weren't as strong as I wanted them to be. And then I started to really amp up the colors. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed was that as long as I was true to a hint of a color that I saw in someone's, in 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 a little area of someone's face, as long as I was true to that, I could amp it up and it really made it 3D. So I don't really have any training and it's just kind of ideas that come to my head, but. Is there um, a relationship that you have with a color that would surprise us? I don't know. I don't know, but it's interesting that my two favorite colors are orange and yellow green because it's the colors of the foliage in the fall and in the spring. Mm -hmm. But I know I don't. I don't know. I think maybe, I mean, I say that, but there's one color that I've always considered to be like a tool and that's phthalo blue. So it's kind of a cyanish blue Mm -hmm. and it's always been kind of the underpinning of, of my work. Now that's fascinating. You speak of an underpinning, which suggests to me a, um, a kind of, um, go-to hierarchy or an anchor in some ways to to a picture that would be reoccurring might that be so i'm not sure exactly what you mean but i do know that if you look at that painting the color Mm -hmm. that the original line or what's traditionally called the cartoon on the canvas is almost always phthalo blue And is that for for your sake, or the or ultimately will we see that that blue cloisonous move that you're making? Can you say that again, please? There's a there's a blue. Is it is it for the your sake to anchor your process, or will we end up seeing that blue uh, in the finished work? Sometimes you will see that blue. Sometimes and not. actually. Yeah, and actually, sometimes it'll all be covered. Sometimes you'll see some of the, you know, skeleton or the line. But in my earlier work, it played a bigger part in my paintings. Mm -hmm. Before I took on so many colors. Now there's the play between the ultra blue and the phthalo blue, each having two different, completely different functions. You know, one blue being closer to the red and the other blue blue being closer to the yellow. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there is a whole thing that goes on in my head it's probably crazy no it probably is um it well could be uh, have its orientation in in what emerged in pointillism um and the relationship between the application of one hue and then the next and the next forming a kind an additive structure that in the at the end makes sense but as it's building very little sense i think that's true tony i really think that's true i was never really attracted to the pointillism because i am so in love with line 
Mm -hmm. But anyway, here, this picture kind of gives you an idea of like these paintings were till the end of the concert and it would be dark. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, it, it was like a race at the end. But part of what happened, it took me a long time to come up with a solution, but part of what would happen would be they would get covered with bugs. I oh, <laughs> were right on the river. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally I realized maybe, I don't know, a couple years later that if I did the lights indirectly, <laughs> they wouldn't go right into the <laughs> Well, that's that's an organic approach huh? to include the bugs in the painting. Luckily, the, for the photography of the painting, once the painting is dry, all it takes is a tissue and they come right off. Okay. But also, I like this picture because it portrays what happens to me for the hours that I'm painting is a very fluid motion, not unlike a dance, where it's just constantly moving. Constantly, constantly. It's not a lot of stopping to figure things out or thinking. You can see already I'm going, you know, it's like my hand isn't over here, but my mind is already ahead of it. Uh -huh. And that, which is why, part of the reason why it's so much fun to do it at a concert. So I think we jumped into very quickly. Can you take us uh, through the process? What, how do you begin work for, a, let's say, a concert? We, we, um, we have made a decision which artist you are going to paint and what happens then? I will research, you know, on Google and YouTube and actually now Yahoo search is better than Google, but I will research getting what I think out of the unbelievable amount of reference that's available these days, what I think are the photos that are really speaking to me. Um, there is a process within the sketching stage. So there's this, and this is um, for all the work that I do, whether it's pen and ink, whether it's painting, whether it's editorial, whether it's this kind of live painting. And the process is very, very straight drawings of both profiles, both three quarter views, and a couple or few straight on views. And then I start to twist and turn and start to work out what my caricature is going to be. And from that's there before you meet an artist right that's pardon? before you actually, that's actually before you meet the oh yes artist. but i will i take full advantage of youtube and i try to watch as many interviews as i can i especially if i can get a, a documentary i love to see where they came from i love to see the way their face moved when they were young the way they talked everything but um then in terms of the painting itself given the time element like sometimes I'm doing three, four, five people for a group. Now in a case like that, and even sometimes when I'm just doing one person, I will do that cartoon on the canvas before I start painting. But I've gotten more courageous in the last couple of years where I will go from a blank, a blank canvas on site. Um, I don't know, I could say more, but I don't know if that's enough about the process. What do you think? Do you meet, uh, do we meet the musicians? Do you, do you already know you said how through, through, I, through your knowledge of their music and research or? I try to meet the musicians. I, one thing I consider to be a plus is that I love painting musicians so much. When I was in high school, I would have little doodles on my um, biology notes or my chemistry notes that were my from out of my head little drawings of full bands with all the <laughs> imaginary but i always have had so much of a joy of of drawing and painting musicians and i although i'm extremely opinionated i have a pretty good sense of popular music maybe not today but for at least a few decades so i i have a um a feeling about when I'm doing a, a musician for Art Park, I have a feeling about the genre or about where they're coming from. But yes, we do invite everyone to cut, you know, who's who I'm going to paint to meet me beforehand. And that is a big part of it uh -huh. um, when that happens. Um, and then what it's happens funny, at the, the concert? The, the, pardon? And then what happens at the concert? At the concert, I can't really partake because I wouldn't get the painting done. Now, there are, there are a couple concerts where like trombone shorty and ziggy marley and there were a few 
maybe garbage. There are some where, you know, I can just paint to the live music, but for better or worse, if it's not music that I can dance to, I can't paint to it. So a lot of times I'll have my headphones on. But you're there at the concert. We didn't really discuss what I mean, I, you do in our court. That's a good, that's a very good point. I think a lot of what happens is the energy, the energy of the crowd, as well as the energy of the musicians, all informs the painting in a way that would never happen in my studio. Now we just we just passed a picture that uh, was up for a, for a bit and likely deserves an explanation. Um, that was from the musician from Yes, right? I I can't remember his name, but or do you mean this one? This one, yes. Oh, this one, yes. This one, this was a great experience I had because Melissa Etheridge was a friend of Bruce Moser who is a longtime music promoter on the East Coast and became a friend of mine just around the same time that I started doing these concerts. We became good friends on the spot when we met. But um, he heard that she was going to be playing at our park and said, you should definitely let Philip paint you. And then he brought me to meet her before the concert. And she was just a sweetheart. She was just so you know, full of, uh, of feeling and compassion and warmth. And it was the most intense experience I had with a, a music, musician before the, you know, because all guards were gone. It was as if we had always known each other and there was something very, let's put it this way, in a very trite way to put it is that we're both huggers. I mean, there was all things, you know, there was no pretense, there was no walls, there was, so there was a sense of, it was almost like we were brother and sister and that really made a big difference in the experience of painting her. We certainly are connecting. Yeah, that is your your eye to eye uh, brings up Biff Henrich's question, which is um, the interesting thing that makes your caricatures work is that the person is still identifiable, no matter how abstract and extended the painting might be. Philip once said to me, Biff reports, that when the eyes in the painting are set, you can go anywhere you want after that. Could you speak about that? Biff asks. Wow, that's great. Biff, thank you, Biff. Biff is wonderful. Biff shot my work for decades, and he's just a phenomenal photographer. Um, that's that's cool. That's really cool. Um, and I don't always do this, although I probably always should. Once I've got my cartoon, once if I... Oftentimes, I'll start with the eyes. Once the eyes are there and once the eyes are communicating what I want them to communicate, the rest is just going to support it. And I, I really feel like, the, you know, it's, it's a success once the eyes are there. But I have entered a lot of paintings thinking, oh, I'll get all the framework and then go to the eyes. But I should probably always do that. <laughs> but, yeah, oh. Uh, Without Biff, I never could have started my, you know, the work I did here in Buffalo after leaving New York. It was because of my relationship with Biff that I was one of the first people in my field in New York to be working outside of New York in the illustration editorial field. Nice, nice. And uh, tell about this picture in the making. Oh, this was this was a lot of fun because I had a chance to meet John Lodge before the concert. I mean, he had a lot of fans waiting to meet him, and I was the last one, and, and so we talked a little bit. And then he said, you know what? I think I'm going to sneak out during the concert and come and see what you're doing. No artist, none of the artists that I painted ever did anything like that. Hmm. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the thing, I mean, I'm sure, the, you know, obviously it was another group playing, but there he was, come to see how I was doing on my painting. And it, it was just such a boost. It was such a lift. And he, again like Melissa Etheridge, you know, no pretense, no wall, no guard. It was just like we had always known each other. And that was, that was great. Mm -hmm. And he liked the painting. Of course, that made a big difference too. <laughs> that matters, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. What's our next picture? Ah, this is one of my favorites. This I really want, I was responding to something I was having a conversation with Tony about, which was, he said, 
do you ever do something that's just minimalist? And I, and I thought about it, and this probably was the best example of that. And this was done shortly after he was killed. And actually, I mean, for what it's worth, it was the first death of anyone in my life that hit me emotionally. I said, it actually surprised me. But it came at a time when he was just, he had just done double fantasy with Yoko and he had just kind of, he'd been in New York for a short time again, but just his presence in New York had been such an encouragement to many, many, many artists. And I remember being taken aback at how much it affected me. But so this was a, a illustration I was asked to do by the Village Voice. But I think that because I had such a strong, felt such a strong, I don't know, psychic bond, whatever, inspiration, whatever, ever since Imagine, you know, that I really felt like he stood alone. Um, I, I think I was able to capture him with a very few lines. The eyes certainly tell the story here, don't they? Yes, and it's funny because where they came from was, uh, my art director said, this is going to be the title of the story. John Lennon is alive and a voidoid. So I actually put Richard Hell's eyes into John Lennon's head. <laughs> <laughs> well, all things are possible. But, it, but it, I mean, it, it could be anybody's eyes. But that's where I based it on the expression. But it very much had to do with what he was facing during the Reagan years in terms of oppression and, you know. Well, it's a subtle matter, isn't it? That the, the um, I think of Ouija's pictures, the um, the photographer in the uh, 40s, and late 30s, um, who wanders the streets of New York and witnessing with his camera murders and um, catastrophes and poverty and insult, um, a full palette of human experience. And if you look towards the center of his pictures, could be a big crowd. There'll be someone looking back at you oh, with, nice. with, with those John Lennon eyes. Um, nice. Yeah, it's a, it's such an anchor. Uh, I was, I appreciate this question also as a return to that, to that strong sensibility of love, letting the eyes anchor the picture. And there's something else that my business partner, John Bartlemy has remarked on and gets a kick out of is when I do a painting where the eyes are look, looking right at you, no matter where you go in the room, they follow you. Mm -hmm. And that's probably yeah. also true of what you, in the paintings you're talking about. Yeah, they're photographs, the ones that I'm speaking Oh, photographs, about. okay. Yeah, yeah. In these paintings, and I don't think it's a, a surprise to tell people that the eyes really play the most important part in all the portraits that I do. The, um, an interesting question from Bobo, uh, who asks, um, or states, caricatures are marvelous, but, capital, but, um, they exaggerate the good and the bad. Has any of your subjects been outraged at the final result? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, several. Uh, the first one I remember with pride was Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't contact me directly, but he was very furious with Fortune magazine. Uh, and um, most recently was uh, Miller um, in the Trump. What's his name, Miller? The guy, the border guy. Well, you got me. I didn't pay much attention to the. Well, anyway, team. one of the chief of staff, I don't know, chief of staff, but anyway, um, anyway, he's the guy who reminded everybody of uh, Goebbels, Goebbels. Stephen Miller. Thank you, Stephen Miller. Um, I did a painting of he and his wife for Vanity Fair, and they were very, very upset. But I took a lot of liberties with that. Um, yeah, there have been several over the years that, that took offense. Um, and I, especially when I was younger, I, I wore that as a badge. 
nowadays I, I rarely do it, although that was only a couple of years ago with Stephen Miller. Some people, you just can't help it. But usually I'll really try to create an image showing more than one, just one kind of demeanor, trying to show the humanity. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The um, you're asked by Bruce Wright, uh, what are you working on now? I just actually finished a painting of Elon Musk. So and? I haven't gotten my next assignment yet, but I just just finished it. And this is for a private commission. Uh huh. And did you enjoy the, the experience? I did. I did because he's such a colorful character mm -hmm. and because I couldn't say, well, I like him or I don't like him. He's very, he's really a kind of a conundrum. There are things that I really don't like about his approach to the life and some things that fascinate me, but he, but it's nice to do a character like that. Mm -hmm. the, um, the music you're listening to with your earphones, is it uh, uh, classical music or? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, there are several go-tos um usually i mean probably the one that i've gone to the most recently particularly when i'm starting a painting is nirvana never mind somehow that album the entire album creates the perfect space the perfect mental space to in a sense take a leap it's like when you're starting a painting, it's almost like you're taking a leap off a cliff. But it takes it, it creates in my mind the perfect mental space to let go of any preconce preconceived notions, to let go of any you know thoughts of what does the client want and any thoughts of am I doing this too far or not? Just this sense of freedom. Um, then usually for me to get through a painting, like to carry me through a painting, it's been a combination of punk and African, but I have to say in the last year, I'm on a steady diet of BTS. It's a phenomenon that I never experienced, never expected, but they are taking it to the next level. Now, the, um, your remarks uh, a moment ago suggest um, your Buddhist practice. Um, for it, it had very much the sense of the archer, and um, and finding, um, not not having to look for your your outcome. Uh, is am I correct in making that assumption? I'm not sure if I know what you mean. Well, you know, what is the, let me ask it straight out then. Well, what is the relationship between your Buddhist practice and your work? Well, there's a couple things. To begin with, when I was 25 and doing a lot of pen and ink work, very strong political work for publications, left leaning publications, I came really, really. Uh, dove into the work of Pablo Picasso and started to become very frustrated. At the same time, I started to be, become very um, almost ill with the anger that was fueling my work, particularly in the Reagan years. And I, as a political caricaturist, in a sense, had become like a judge. And I started developing this characteristic where I was just constantly judging everyone and criticizing everyone. And um, when, when I it got to a point where I was feeling like completely lost inside my own, you know, kind of anger and despair, um, it was at that time that I met this practice of Buddhism. Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism, chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, and immediately experienced the wall dissolving around me, the wall, the, the cement wall, Re immediately experienced a sense of freedom. But more, more than anything else, it started to move away from concern for myself being my driving force. 
and started to really open up to, uh, this sounds trite, but to a reality that other people existed. But no, really, to be able to develop or to be able to feel compassionate, to be able to work on that and to be able to develop that. And I think that over the years, since that time, as I gradually developed more compassion or more of the, qual more of the qualities of the Buddha, gradually, gradually, gradually caring more about other people. And my work has changed in the sense that it's become more accessible. And it's become more accessible, I think, because I'm feeling more about the person that I'm doing. But more than that, I'm coming more and more from a place that as human beings, we all share the same life. So instead of say a politician painting him as though this is the person who's the reason why I'm unhappy, trying to create images of people that are many-sided. And I think that um, it's increased over the years. I know that's trite and simple explanation, but. Hardly, thank you for it. Well, thank you for asking. No, I yeah. mean, it changed. what changed for me was art was everything. As I was from 15 till 25, nothing really mattered but my art. And was my art the best in what I did and the competition? And then also the anger, anger at authority, anger at everything. But art was everything. And then from the time, from for the last 40 years almost, it's really been a growing thing where the art is just a reflection of the main thing, which is what, what really matters. What really matters is that how can we develop our own compassion, develop our own, you know, raise our own life condition person by person by person for the only real true path to peace. And I think the art is just a shadow or a reflection of what's happening inside me. Well, thank you for that reflection. It, uh, it really orients um, what we are, what we're trying to talk about for we, we have stretched to fashion these conversations around the park and its relationship to ideas. And you, you've just presented a, um, certainly a, uh, ideas in the depth that um, that uh, we, we all are grateful for, um, the, and it leads a bit to um, to a question uh, that we that we had from um, Mr. Burke, and it is I'm I'm looking for it right now, and it was um, well I'm not finding it anyway. The question was um, in in addition to um, caricature. Are there other forms of art that you explore? I have done some landscape work. Um, that's probably my second favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, not enough, unfortunately, but it takes a client who's going to hire me because of how much it takes to get your studio out somewhere to do it. Uh -huh. um, I think probably the thing I enjoy the most, and it was how I started painting, is when someone is sitting for me, not a celebrity, but just someone, whether it's a friend or a family, is sitting and I'm painting them. And it's a life to life thing that happens that's really kind of eternal. I mean, you said this was a question from Mr. Burke? Yes. Joseph Burke? Joseph, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's my brother. I Joseph. know. I know. <laughs> and he's familiar with a few of the pieces that I've done of siblings. But there was one in particular I did of my brother Robert um, when early on in my painting time when there's just something that happens when you're painting from the model. And there's no schedule. There's no time. And it... it with my one brother, Robert, his personality is perfectly suited to being a model because there's no anxiety, there's no tension, there's no discomfort. And so for hours painting, but something happened during this painting where I remember, and I remember a little spot on his cheek that I was painting at the time, but I, and, and I, I was completely straight at the time. 
But I remember this sensation of that it was a hundred years from now and it was a hundred years previous and it was two and 300 years previous it was as if time disappeared. And that action of what happened in the painting from life to life, what was happening from life to life, there was just this sense of timelessness. Um, doesn't always happen, but something does always happen when you're painting from life that is so much more difficult and so much more rewarding where you yeah. have the opportunity to really, really get the guts of the person, really get the insights, which is what I'm always trying to do in, in the work that I'm working usually from photographs. One of the first experiences I had was when I painted Andy Warhol. And this was right around the same time that I painted my brother, Robert. But um, one of the hardest things to do when you're working from life from the model like that because there's a sensitivity that the person is going to be looking at that painting soon and you really don't want to hurt their feelings um, because they've been so kind to do it to you, but you want to be truthful and honest. But um, one of the hardest things is to believe that what you're doing is working. <laughs> To really believe that the painting is happening and it's not a total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and it especially happened when I was painting Andy Warhol. I was petrified, but but it's it's a whole it's a much more challenging and much more rewarding experience. Uh, didn't that uh, didn't that um, occasion begin with um, an opportunity to paint from life? Yes, yes, that mm. was that was a wonderful experience. Oh, uh, it was it was just before I moved out of New York, but I had seen him kind of across the room, so to speak, at a couple different things in New York, where we locked eyes for a moment, and I and I just had this sense like I don't know why I don't really follow his artwork. I understand his the importance of what he did, but I can't say I was a Andy Warhol fan. But there was a sense that I had that we have some karma together and we're gonna do something together. And then just before I left the city, I was in my um, the third floor apartment in the village and I was looking out the window and I saw that hair and I ran downstairs. I said, hi, my name is Philip Burke and I wanna paint you from life, I, would you sit for me? And I was totally taken aback because my image of him was like some space cadet. I just thought he was like out there. And he immediately looked at me and said, oh, I love what they're doing with you at Vanity Fair. Anytime, come anytime. And it, it took me a good year to get up the courage to do it. And I'd already moved back to Buffalo. But um, my wife, Jerry, and I got in. We, I remember we rented a Volvo wagon for what it's worth. And we drove my studio there and set up in the, in the factory. And he sat for me. And it was terrifying and wonderful experience. Well, thanks for sharing that. That was that's because uh, it certainly is a story that stuck in my memory. Also, um, the, we, we really shouldn't leave without um, giving an opportunity, which is a rare treat. Um, we we ended the slides by um, by showing uh, Ziggy Marley, and um, I wish you would comment on on that relationship and image as you would see fit and. Uh, and then the image um, to your to your um, right behind you, and and that wonderful picture of your son. Okay. And, uh, perhaps that's okay. a that's a favorable way to end. But we're willing to keep going. You know that. I'm good. I good. got nothing else to do. All right. Good day. <laughs> the of you, Marley. Marley. Yeah. Um, what was Ziggy? I didn't actually meet him until after the concert. So, um, but I will say that I, I really delighted in um, the fact that, first of all, the fact that I was painting him because he had a reputation. There was a reputation in this area for the concerts. He was the concert to see at Art Park, but also because I had always enjoyed painting his father so many times. And I, when I started to really dive into his music and, die, and see him on YouTube. And I was so impressed. I was so impressed by his, 
heart for the people around him. And it was just, it felt effortless to bring it into the painting. And it was confirmed when he came by after the concert together with his wife and a couple other of the people, you know, the, his handlers or whatever it was. But, you know, it was just, it was so rewarding to see him react to the painting of himself because he's very stoic. I mean, for what it's worth, and I know you know this, Tony, but you all, it's so easy to come up with an idea of what a celebrity is like. And when you meet him, it's most often not at all what they're really like. But when I met him, he was so stoic. But to see him let that go, you know, to see how he reacted to this painting was just wonderful. Now, in terms of the paintings behind me, um, the, this painting over here is out of too many to count self-portraits. I think I have a Van Gogh thing going on, but anyway, that's <laughs> probably my favorite, just because I went overboard in terms of what I've known to do to other people. And I really twisted myself around. But also, um, just because it, it, when I look at, ever since I first finished it and looked at it, what I always see is, well, I see a lot of things in it, but the thing I see the most is the moment that I'm in the middle of a painting and somebody's knocking on the door because they need me to answer something. And there's a phone or anything, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just the idea of the artist being interrupted. But um, I think more than anything, you can take the most liberties with yourself. You know, you, you can really, and this I felt like, you know, say if I was doing Reagan or I was doing, uh, trying to think of people, Clinton, you know, people that I've done a lot editorially, the more you do them, you've, maybe you've done them 10 times, you can really go wild with yourself. You know, that's a face you know better than any. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can just take it way out there and still capture that. Now the painting there is my current favorite painting, but that, that's a painting of my son, Jeffrey. And uh, one of the rare times that I've had the opportunity to paint him live, but it's also a painting. It's what I probably would be doing if I wasn't such a commercial artist, but it, it's a painting where there's no client, there's no deadline, there's no, expectation except what's happening in the moment and my son happens to be a wonderful artist musician poet photographer he just has that kind of mind so that always adds to it too but more than anything you know i know that face like i know my own and i know that that person you know he spent oh more than half his life living with me and um so that freedom i don't know how well you can see it from where you are but it's to me, it's the uh, the musician with painting on his mind, but the freedom in that painting is something that that I dream of in all my work. But it doesn't really happen in the commercial work so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your candor, and uh, and also thank you very much for your insight. Um, it's been... Oh, I see my I see my niece saying hello. Hi, Jen. That's now, my how, wife's niece. Uh, yeah. How, how are you seeing that? Yeah, yeah. It says, from Jen Thomas to all panelists in a smiley. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. Very nice. Well, uh, Philip, this has been like, um, like reading poetry. Um, oh, this has been so true. much fun. Tony, this is wonderful. I mean, I had just have to say how excited I was to hear that you were doing this how much I appreciate our relationship from the time we first met, was it the late seventies? I don't know, but more than anything, what happened when you came to the birch field and what you were able to make happen there. I, I just, I'm in your debt. I, it's wonderful to spend any time with you. And this has been so much fun. Well, thank you. Oh, we can't leave without, without answering Jeff Klein's question. Why did you choose to live in Niagara Falls? He asks. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, my wife is from the falls. And so um, I was spending an awful lot of time at my in-laws house when I was living in Buffalo or, you know, a couple of times rented cottages in Canada, but I was, this was always had turned into a base. And then when 
my father and mother-in-law became ill later in their life. My wife and I moved in and were taking care. We had like two hospital beds and two different rooms. And then we, we really helped them go. And then we stayed. They, they gave us the house and we stayed. But I like Niagara Falls for a couple of reasons. One, because how gorgeous it is to be able to go there and, you know, walk around there. But more than anything, it's, um, it's kind of like just far enough out of the way for me. But it's close. It's close to anything you would need. Mm -hmm. And Niagara on the Lake is there. Toronto's really close. But it's not Buffalo. I spend a lot of time in Buffalo having grown up there. And I like Buffalo, but I got tired of living there. But it's small enough and out of the way enough, but yet in the middle of everything, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It also is um, uh, large enough to have the character of a city and small enough to be able to embrace it and understand it better than one might a city. Um, I favored in um, Lackawanna. I loved writing about Lackawanna when I was uh, beginning working for the Lackawanna newspaper. Oh, wow. What? A, oh, yeah. Hmm. What haven't we asked that we should have, Philip? There is a question from Allison before that. Allison? Okay. Allison. When I is, it Allison, is it Allison Mitchell? Allison, I don't know. That's Allison. When I view your work, I feel as though that there is something particularly enlightening and secretive about what you have learned about your subject, but you have also gained during the process of creation. So it's more of a comment than a question. I'm sorry. Can you read that again? Let's do it again. When I view your work, I feel as though that there is something particularly enlightening and secretive about what you have learned about your subject, but that you have also gained during the process of creation. Oh, I like that. I really like that. I think that's true. I think that's true. I, if it is the Allison, I think it is. She's a fellow Buddhist and, um, I, but I, I, and an artist, a wonderful musician. But I, I, I really do believe that. I think that's absolutely true. And Sonia, that, thank you so much. Of course. This is Anytime. so great. This is so great having this art part relationship that you've enabled, really. You know, like Tony, you and I became fast friends the moment we met. And it's been nothing but great. And I look forward to more and more and more. More and more and more, exactly. That's it. We keep growing together, and it's it. Art Park is is so much better for it, and it, we we have so much else to do. There's there's so much more to do else. So much yes. more to do, and hopefully different yes. different experiences and inspirations coming our way, right? I think so. Well, we hope to see you again this during the summer, and also um, we hope to continue this series during the summer. So um, uh, we'll see you later. Beautiful. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angelie. Bye bye. Thank you.